This is Actualize Freedom. Straight talk on growing clicks and conversions on Amazon FBA from people doing it every day. Now here's your host, digital marketing acrobat, Danny Kenji Carlson. What's up, guys? Danny Carlson here with the Actualize Freedom Podcast, and this is going to be really relevant to you as an Amazon seller if you are getting smashed with crazy shipping costs or you're not allowed to ship in as much inventory as you need into Amazon's warehouses. And we're only really at the start of Q4 crazy season, and it's only going to get worse, right? So this is going to be a super crucial episode to listen to if you want to not run into these massive problems in Q4, right? How do you fix the crazy shipping costs? How do you make sure you actually have inventory in Amazon warehouses to sell to your customers for November and December season? So I have on with us today here, he is from, um, you may have heard Nate Ginsburg's episodes on the Actualized Freedom Podcast. This is another member of Sellerplex, the same company that is coming on to talk about all these supply chain issues and everything like that. So we have, I, is it Ivan Torlopov or Ivan? I'm, I'm totally going to butcher it. That's fine either way. Uh, hey, Danny, yeah, it's Ivan, I guess it's easier. Yeah. Ivan Torlopov joining us from St. Petersburg, Russia, which I've heard is a very beautiful place, but um, you just got back from a vacation over there. So tell us a little bit about uh, a little bit about the vacation that got you refreshed and ready to take on this crazy madness in Q4 here. All right. Uh, yeah, I just got back. Uh, I was just traveling here in in Russia to some region, a uh, place called Kazan. It's a it's a beautiful town. I've never been there, and a lot of my kind of ancestry is from there. And it was a pretty amazing uh, trip, and and just how kind of deep I was able to get into that kind of sort of culture. It's a bit different from the main uh, Russian kind of culture. Uh, so, so yeah. <laughs> I was, it was pretty cool, went there for like a five, five days, had a lot of good food, and uh, yeah, I just walked around with my family. Excellent. Well, I think most Americans listening here, they think Russians, they probably think about hackers and, uh, you know, all the all the crazy sides of Amazon, uh-huh. but it is actually a really beautiful country. So um, definitely recommend definitely, checking yeah. that out if you guys uh, are interested in that. But let's dive into the meat and potatoes here. The actual money-making side of this episode is how do we get around these crazy issues or maybe not we can't get around the crazy shipping issues in q4 but what are some things that we can do to minimize the damage right because i've heard shipping costs going up from like you know what used to be a four thousand dollar shipment to like a forty thousand dollar shipment crazy stuff right and and it's really damaging some amazon sellers to the point where it like some of them are, are just not able to do it even so like what's the current situation and, and really what are some of the ways that um you guys at sellerplex are have figured out to get around this yeah then th- thanks for asking so so yeah i mean generally the way i i look at it I, yeah i don't think there's any sort of like magic wound kind of solution to fix it all in, in kind of one swing right but uh, yeah, as long as you uh, manage your supply chain at sort of an expert level yeah, and, and like staying in really good control over your inventory and kind of what you're doing, uh, you can exactly minimize the, the damage for your business. And, you know, there, there is a way to stay in stock. There is a way to, you know, keep up good inventory levels. There is a way to, uh, you know, just stay in control of your inventory and with that, not lose revenues and, and so, sort of be ahead of your competition too, because uh, a lot of the sellers in Q4 are going to be out of stock and those who will kind of have, have, the, have the stock to sell are going to be ahead just, just because of that, right? And uh, yeah, today I do really kind of want to dive into some specifics on how and what can be done to, uh, yeah, to manage this. So overall, uh, kind of what's happening from high level, right, you mentioned, uh rates are through the roof right so we've seen them go we are really high up to like 40 30 thousand dollars currently we are seeing about 15 to 20k per container from china to la which is still like four times as high as last year and you know whatever like 10 times high as, as we used to pay like three years ago right and uh on top of that you know paying this crazy uh kind of uh pricey rates Still doesn't guarantee you space, right? So you you know you may you know agree to pay twenty thousand dollars for a container and still be delayed. You know still not get a container on time. And then once it's in route, you know ports are congested, 
and uh, they're either in kind of longer transit times. So even like overpaying doesn't guarantee you that 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 your freight gets on, uh, you know, um, in uh, uh, you know in stock or, or to, to the U.S. on time. So, so, so something that 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 uh, we can do to address this. So first issue is the costs, right? So one kind of proven tactic to manage your cost uh, has been uh, consolidation. So essentially consolidating your LCLs into full containers or you know, if you're shipping air, you know, tr try to switch to ocean and, and, and really, you know, especially uh, this is applicable if you're maybe buying from multiple suppliers in China and just taking a couple of extra steps, like asking your forwarder or maybe managing it yourself uh, with one of the suppliers to, you know, sh ship, ship the goods domestically to one location. It could be one of the suppliers. It could be your forwarder's uh, warehouse. The latter is, is is actually a little bit more professional, and you 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 you'll have more control of, of that. You don't have to you know rely on one of the other suppliers. So um, yeah, just 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 have have your goods shipped into one place and then consolidate to uh, to a full container, and we and it just has never been more cost effective than today to do that. So we are seeing about ten to fifteen thousand dollars in savings, like per container consolidation. So, you know, depending on what your volume of, of freight is, it, it can potentially save you like, you know, hundreds of thousands or, or, or like, close to, like if you're shipping, like even like, if, if, even if you're shipping like just a few containers per year, uh, you know, those kind of savings multiply and, and can give you like close to, you know, you know, again, it's going to depend on the volume, but could be just a few containers could be up, up to like a hundred dollars in savings. Okay, uh, so what you're talking about basis, here, to right? clarify mm -hmm. for everyone, this is LCL shipment, so less than a container, less than one full container, but then you're yeah. getting, mm -hmm. you know, let's say all of your products together from your different manufacturers, if you have multiple manufacturers, and then putting them all to one freight forwarder to then fill a full container. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Thanks for uh, elaborating on this. Yeah, exactly. right, yeah, I know yeah. it can get really technical mm -hmm. for some people when it comes to the shipping stuff, but this is why it's such right. a nightmare for people is because no one likes to be talking about oh, LCLs and like it's not the fun stuff to be talking about, right? People want to be doing product launch promotions and all this kind of stuff, sure. but if they don't have the product in stock, they're not going to sell or any promotions, right? So it, it can be yeah, a little exactly. bit dry, but this is like you said, this is the money making stuff in Q4, right? The people who have the stock are the ones who are going to be actually selling the product. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. So so yeah. Again, like, like exactly like you said. So a lot a lot of the entrepreneurs out there. This is just yeah, just a pain. Uh, you know, a headache, and uh, you know, really consider hiring an expert to just do it for you. And you know, essentially with this hire, it's it, you know, you have to uh, kind of find someone that can uh, uh, yeah, can just uh, run it on on his or her own and and just like let you uh just confirm like quantity amounts every every so often but uh yeah just just do it do it for you and so it gets to, to to move to the next point in terms of what else can you do to to save on your costs right um you uh, essentially do have to shop for rates every time you ship so what what it means is 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 asking for quotes from multiple freight forwarders and uh Cost comparing, uh, you know, asking them about their space allocations. Do they have the space for the for the quotes that they're providing? You know, uh, I, you know, just really working with them in terms of uh, the the routing options and the uh, the the cost options. And so that uh, alone, again, can uh, help you save like thousands of dollars per year, especially in this kind of market that's tight and we see, uh, you know, rates sort of all over the place. So just by asking a few forwarders, you can, you know, these days definitely be saving about like one, one K per container because again, rates fluctuate so much. And, uh, you know, one forwarder could be quoting at, you know, 15 for, uh, for, for instance, and another one at like 1350 and definitely, yeah. Just, just seeing that comparison allows you to uh, understand what's your, what's your kind of best option and, and, and do that. And so a lot of times what we see happens is uh, sellers kind of get, uh, comfortable right with their main sort of uh forwarder provider that they're kind of like to talk to they have a good relationship with maybe and uh, yeah just and then and just kind of get complacent with them and um uh end up paying you know overpaying on freight so that's also yeah like well, a that brings up a really good point too that 
these freight forwarders might be really good for a period of time, but so many of the big freight forwarding companies just hit a point eventually where they just get really overloaded, right? They're a victim of their own success. So like it's, it's a very common scenario where a freight forwarding company is going to be good for, for months and for maybe a number of years. And then word just gets out that they're an awesome freight forwarding company, right? They start getting a lot of referrals or maybe some influencer has now shared them in their Amazon FBA course. Then now all of a sudden they have way more business than they can actually handle, right? Now they're a terrible freight forwarder. So you, you do have to watch out for that as well as um, I love the tip you said that rates are fluctuating so much right now just because there's so much above the rates. You got to think there's, there's probably some lower level employees who are just creating quotes all day. Um, you can't expect them to be super on top of just getting you the best price all the freaking time, right? It's just someone just needs to get a quote out the door and, um, you know, maybe they, they dropped an extra one or two K on top of that quotation that he should have. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah, do shop, do ask like multiple, um, uh, contacts, ask for referrals kind of within your field. Maybe someone's like working with that awesome forwarder who's awesome today, not like, you know, a year ago, like you said, right? Um, so yeah, and then also what defines a good contract or good forwarder there is someone who's gonna work with you essentially with, you know, making sure you get the space. And for that, we notice and kind of these days recommend to actually uh, look at China-based forwarders and China-based agents. So historically, you know, uh, I used to kind of prefer and, and tell my, my clients to, uh, you know, actually maybe maybe it's better to work with, you know, it used to be better to work with like a US-based forwarder who's gonna have a better service, especially at the destination, will, you know, have better understanding of how to clear the goods properly and do all that good stuff. But these days, because of all these space issues in China, it's actually better to work directly with the agents in China. So just be on top of them, like, uh, you know, in their, it's best to kind of talk to them what, during their, their business hours, because like if they, if they say, all right, I have the container space, you know, next week or whatnot, uh, and just confirm it right away, because the kind of the, the container space, it, you know, it, it, it gets booked uh, uh, at crazy pace these days, right? So, so you just kind of want to be on top of it and, and confirm uh, your space allocation as, as soon as you get a good option. Yeah, that's a, that's um, a great tip there. And another tip for maybe a lot of the newer sellers who haven't done a whole lot of business with Chinese companies or Chinese agents in general, just get them on WeChat, right? WeChat is like the equivalent of like, you know, every person in China is going to be using WeChat and it's got a great feature where it will automatically translate in between your languages. So it's going to be so much better than, you know, them punching your emails into Google Translate and then, you know, typing something up and then them punching it back into Google Translate right there. You're actually getting like a live translated conversation in Messenger. It's just a little bit more organic, a little bit, a little bit better. So that's going to, that's going to cut down a lot on miscommunications and the speed of communication from my experience. Totally. Totally, WeChat is a way, is a way to go with, with China-based uh, uh, parties for sure. And um, yeah, uh, I guess also on the on the subject of how you can work better with with your freight forwarder, right? And how do we define like a good contractor? So it's someone also that will give you options in terms of routings, and uh, and you do also want to be proactive about it and ask your forwarder. Right. What is uh, what is what are what are the good uh, you know routing options for my freight? Uh, what I mean here is uh, you know in the normal market when there when there are no con port congestions where there are no delays, you know you know your routing most likely, right? It's the closest port to your uh, supplier probably or closest main port to your supplier, and then if you're shipping from China, most likely you want to go to LA, right? Because it's like a you know the main port there. And that's in in a, in a normal again a normal case in a normal market. These days, you know, LA is congested, and it's probably gonna get even more congested in Q4. Uh, uh, you know, main ports in China, same same situation over there. And so, what you are you want, want to be looking out? Are there maybe asking your forwarder? Uh, are there any like alternative port options? So, to give you a specific example, right? So, one of our customers is kind of was accustomed to shipping from a uh, port of right and that was like a that happened like a few weeks ago and the rates were at about like 20k from that port 
and uh, there's a port nearby called Shaman. It's a little bit farther away from the origin point, so we had to overpay on trucking like a couple hundred dollars. And domestic, you know, ship domestic trucking in China is is pretty cheap, right? Um, and so just by overpaying and 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 taking that longer haul on trucking at the origin, we were able to ship it ship it via another port, avoid congestion, and uh, do it at a lower rate. And so we shipped at 17k. Uh, uh, for the ocean container. So essentially, overall, saving about 2,600 uh, from this sort of uh, um, an action step, if that makes sense. And so that, 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 that's what I'm talking about. So just, uh, you know, looking for alternative origin ports and alternative uh, origin points, um, you know, in China or wherever you're shipping from, and then same at the destination in the U.S. Right, so just it's going to depend on your uh, in, on the specifics of your supply chain, and um, and kind of yeah, just just some context needs to be uh, evaluated and understood in order to like give you like a clear advice. But uh, for instance, you know, avoiding LA and just shipping to like Northern California op, uh, ports or Seattle could save you on the on the transit time. Uh, you know, if it makes sense, it could all, you, you could also consider uh, East East Coast, right? So going to East Coast ports or even Texas. Um, so all that, uh, you know, you can discuss with your forwarder and, and should discuss and should kind of consider while making the decision on, 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 on your routings. Yeah, that's a great tip to you. And just asking, right? Like you don't even have to do all the groundwork as long as you know what the actual ports are that are somewhat close by, right? But if you don't ask for those additional options, those additional quotes, it's pretty likely that your forwarder is just gonna give you, this is what it costs to go from here to here because that's what you asked for, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because uh, for most, yeah, again, like, you know, for most most of the time you're gonna be talking to like a kind of mid-level manager at the, at the freight forwarding company who gets bunch of requests every day he's not gonna do the thinking for you unless he's you know a really good kind of kind of kind of point of contact that you found totally yeah and you know the language barrier can be a bit of a mess too so yeah taking the driver's seat a little bit but it's it's really just asking right you don't have to go do all this all this crazy stuff and uh, make all the calculations and everything like that uh, but when it comes to the the crazy supply chain mess going on here is there any other good recommendations for for keeping the cost down or, or avoiding just any giant problems? Sure, sure. So uh, I think there are two major problems, right? The rate, so the cost, and then also transit times. And so the the longer the transit times, so some uh, effects of it is the main threat is you you can you know run out of stock before before the cargo arrives, right? Uh, kind of secondary threat is it's a, it's a higher burden on your cash flow. So essentially, to avoid running out of stock with with longer transit times, you do have to buy more inventory. You do have to kind of be very careful with how much you buy to not be overstocked, right? And just like buy enough, but not not too much. And that's kind of you know is a general uh, idea of of running your inventory or, or supply chain management effectively. But in in this times, you do have to be kind of really fluent and really kind of up to date with what's going on at, at each sort of leg of your supply chain. So if there's a port, if there's a, a delay at the origin, you have to consider that. Like if there's uh, you know delay at the destination, you have to consider that. If there are like problems with clearing your your cargo and you're seeing delays there, you know you have to, you have to think about your your main KPIs within, within the supply chain. And the, the main KPI normally, uh, the, what we are considering is essentially number of days that you want to have uh, within your supply chain, right? So um, what I'm, you know, to, to give you an idea. So right now uh, you want to have, like if you're ship shipping from China via ocean and, uh, uh, and your, you know, production times is more or less normal about 30 to 40 days. You want to have at least 200 days worth of stock overall within your supply chain, and and probably actually a little bit more than that. So 200 to 220 to, um, um, yeah, just to account for all of the uh, foreseen delays. Uh, you know, account to uh, for all the kind of unforeseen delays, and then uh, the the challenge is also is how do you calculate like what sort of sales 
uh, daily sales level do you use to calculate those those 200 days, if that makes sense. So uh, because your, your sales trends like per skew, they also fluctuate, right? So, uh, you know, it can go up and down, uh, you know, and the way you analyze your sales trends and, 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 and what, you know, the question is like, what do we use as your average uh, daily sale to, to, you know, forecast your inventory? So that's, that's a, you know, that's kind of a, um, a challenge for, for many sellers. And uh, you do have to kind of have good, good systems in place to, to analyze the sales trends and to, you know, collect uh, inventory data for, you know, for your supply chain and just kind of be on top of like how much inventory, how, how many days worth of stock do you have today in, with a new inventory? Do, do you have an answer to that question? And, and like how much more do you need to buy to like be close to your target KPIs? And like, how would you evaluate a situation? Because I know a lot of people are in this situation right now where they're facing a, a very potentially large period of time where they're going to be out of stock. And then if they do a, an air shipment, then they're going to be, you know, just unprofitable or just they're going to take a huge chunk out of the profit, get in the air shipment. How would you evaluate a decision like that? Like at, at what point is it worth it to just take the cut and like maybe even sell something at like a break even or even even losing a little bit of money just to stay in stock and actually keep your product selling? Yeah, yeah. So it's going to uh, really depend on your uh, the type of cargo you're shipping, right? And and, uh, and you, you want to project and calculate your kind of per unit uh, freight cost. So if you're thinking about shipping via air, right? So just project, like, you know, get the rate, uh, think about how much it's going to cost you per unit and see if you're going to, you know, still be profitable, if you're going to be breaking even, if you're going to be losing money, you, you know, it, it's also acceptable, right? As long as it's, you know, uh, it just depends on the um, uh, kind of volume uh, and, and how much you're going to be losing in a sense, right? So uh, what, what some, some techniques, right? So if you are know that you're running out of stock, right? And you have maybe a large order in China that's that's ready to go. So you, you uh, can split ship, right? So you can ship just a bit of it via air just to uh remain in stock or get back in stock sooner uh and then ship the rest via ocean and here the bit of a challenge is also to calculate how much how much cargo do you need to ship via air right so you have to think about the difference uh, between kind of when your uh chaser ocean shipment is going to arrive the difference in terms of you know transit times and number of days how much you want to cover with that air shipment in terms of n number of days and what what is again what is the sales uh level per day that you want to choose to, to calculate that but once you do that it's like overall you can do yeah split ship 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 a part via air and then another thing to uh, uh manage your transit times is actually these days uh they're faster less than container uh options like freight options versus full full container um fcls right and this is actually a kind of Difference. So it's a new situation on the market. So before LCLs or less than container shipments always used to take longer than than full containers. Now they're kind of fast fast boats. What they what they call them? Uh, I think it's called Matson. It's like the main kind of go to uh, fast boat option for LCL cargo that allows you to. Uh, it's kind of like a sweet spot between normal ocean like full container uh shipment and uh, air it's going to be more expensive than full container like on a per unit level but it's going to be a lot less expensive than than air and can get you you know back in stock or avoid out of stock um uh you know just by choosing that option and also uh, again it's a very odd time so some things that we're seeing actually so before i was talking about going and consolidating your uh less than container shipments into full container shipments to save on cost but we're actually now seeing also some sellers, for some sellers, it makes sense in certain situations to avoid out of stock is to go from full container to LCL to like fast LCL to be able to. And so the reasons why people are doing it is to get the space. So it's actually a little bit easier to get a less than container space than full container space. Uh, and then also, you know, get that fast, uh, fast transit times um, and uh, fast um, Port processing that this uh, you know fast LCL option is is providing these days. 
Yeah, just finding that balance between the, the profitability and the speed, the whatever that makes sense for your situation because it's so complex right now. I swear we're going to see like Somalian pirates just start to start to jump into the space and start getting shipments for the Amazon sellers. You know, like if I, if I was a crew of pirates in Somalia right now, I'd be I'd be sailing for China <laughs> to go pick up sure. some products. <laughs> sure, that's a good, uh, good business idea. <laughs> But Ivan, we're coming to the end of our time here. There's one more thing I really wanted to touch upon before we wrap up here. It's something that a lot of sellers are also having problems with right now, which is the inventory limits. And I know there's a lot of confusion around the Amazon seller space right now about exactly how to, uh, I don't want to say manipulate these numbers, but how to make them go in your favor, right? So just talk a little bit about like, what do you recommend for people to to really handle the inventory limits and not be stuck in a situation where they can't ship in enough inventory. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for asking. So, I mean, from from high level, yeah. What what main main factor is is the IPI score, right? And so, by managing your IPI score in kind of like a it's like a long term game too. You do have to kind of do do, do things right in terms of uh, uh, your Amazon specific supply, you know, part of the supply chain management to keep it up, right? Um, but you know, if you're in a case where, where your IPI score is low and your limits are truly hitting and maybe you're getting desperate because some of your main sellers are running out of stock and you just, you know, and then seller central is not allowing you to create a shipment. Right. So in those cases, we've seen sellers and, 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 you know, uh, successfully use some techniques. And, uh, so for instance, this, uh, tool called shipment maker pro has been, a uh, uh, a life saver for, for some sellers. So what it allows to do is, uh, in context of uh, in inventory limits, it allows to create like the automate, of pro uh, automate the process of creating uh, fulfillment orders. So essentially the, 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 the technique is that you can create uh, fulfillment orders to, uh, um, you know, to, to have the system think that you're, you're going to be sh shipping out, uh, ship shipping inventory out of, the, out of Amazon. And then uh, it will allow you to create shipments uh, after that. And then uh, within a couple of weeks, you can delete the fulfillment orders and not actually remove the, the inventory. And so, um, again, we've seen this done. We, we haven't seen uh, sellers have issues with that so far, right? This is, you know, but I would also not necessarily recommend to do that, right? So, uh, just 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 letting you know it, it is an option but great you know there, yeah there, there is there is a there is a you know way to automate that we haven't seen people having having issues with that but you know only i guess use it if you're if you're kind of in a desperate situation and you have no sort of other choice right uh and then uh on top of that that sorry go ahead yeah do you want to comment? yeah and, and then so like that's definitely an option for people, but I, I want you to talk a little bit about how do people keep their score in good standing? Because it seems to be like some people are misunderstanding it, like they're just removing all of their kind of slower moving products out of Amazon when really that actually might be hurting them rather than helping them, right? Uh, yeah, so I mean, there, there are a few factors uh, that, that affect the IPI score, right? So. Uh, from the top of my head, so one of the one of the big factors is actually the sell through rate, right? So uh, you want to look at what what SKUs are showing up at having like low sell through rate, and maybe uh, those are going to be most likely your lower selling SKUs. So maybe run some promotions for them, maybe hire a PPC agency to like just just optimize the campaigns for uh, for those like low selling SKUs. And, and just try to push them out of inventory via maybe dropping the price too could could I kind of help it just depends right uh, uh, and just like, kind of st try to st stimulate sales for those slow selling SKUs maybe for, for a lot of sellers you know uh, it, it can make sense to like liquidate the inventory that way or liquidate the SKUs that way and just focus on the you know top twenty percent of the SKUs that are bringing most sales right uh, <clears throat> so that's one one way to look at it. Uh, another thing uh, is uh, you want to be staying on top of your stranded inventory factor as well. So uh, that you know is not a job for for a uh, for the owner. That's for sure. That's a very operational task. Right? You just want to have someone 
uh, that's managing your account to be checking on that uh, stranded inventory on a on a daily basis, essentially, and just making sure that the the stranded inventory errors or or, or messages that that yeah, that Amazon uh, system kind of uh, shows are resolved in a timely manner, and that can get you in green uh, on that factor. And so there's also uh, the factor of uh, uh, just uh, just how much inventory or like in, in stock rate, right? So uh, essentially, if you're running a stock on some some high selling SKUs, Amazon kind of tells you to restock, and that's the tricky part of Amazon, right? It can tell you to restock and then also limit your uh, restock uh, quantities at the same time. So that's that's just uh, you know uh, how it is. But but anyway, you just want to be staying on top of, of all those factors and not a, on a uh, you know, not just today or tomorrow, but just just in the long term, because that that inventory score is is again a long term game. You wanna uh, just just be managing it properly over the course of a few months, and you'll get in a, in a better place, you know, um, than than you are today. You know, if yeah, you and then one final thing to add to that: uh, a friend of mine pointed out that if you only have a few units of some really slow moving products, that can actually be good for your score because. Um, it's a, a relative metric. So like if you're selling one unit per day of something you only have 10 in stock of, then from Amazon's perspective, that's great, right? The sell through rate on that is is good by their standards. But if it's one unit per day and you have a thousand in stock, then that's gonna be that's gonna be a problem. Right? So that's something to keep in mind too, not just removing everything that's selling slow just because it's selling slow, but maybe maybe trying to play with those numbers a bit so that you you have a small amount of stock, and then you're still selling through with the small amount of stock, can actually can actually uh, make your score better. Yeah, yeah, makes 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 good sense. But awesome, Ivan. This has been a really useful episode for people. If uh, you know, if you guys are still listening here, your head is probably spinning, and you've probably been smashing your face against your computer screen for the past uh, couple months here, trying to get this stuff figured out, and maybe okay. you lost a bunch of money, but hopefully this will. Um, at least help you get a few thousand dollars back over your next shipments over the Q4 season because, you know, these small things can really be the big things when it comes to you, the big gun time, Black Friday and, you know, December and all that crazy stuff. So thanks for coming on here, Ivan. If people want to reach out to you or learn more about Sellerplex, where's the best place for them to do that? Um, yeah, so our website is uh, sellerplex.com. Um can we maybe also link a uh, uh, an article on the subject that we have on our blog? To, yeah, absolutely. To this, That'll uh, be, uh, we'll put the link to that in the show notes, uh, KenjiRY.com slash blog in the show notes of this episode here with uh, Ivan Tolopov. Uh, we'll put the link to that blog here. I have it in front of me. Um, very thoroughly goes through most of the stuff that we talked about today, the routing options and all those kind of things. So it's kind of like your guys' notes for today's episode here. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so happy to uh, yeah feel free to reach out. Happy to you know give some free consult and and just like understand your needs a, a bit better. And uh, yeah, so do not hesitate to 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 hit me up. Yeah, and just to clarify for everyone here who's interested in talking to you guys, you guys focus on uh, supply chain uh, logistics, kind of like the operations of of FBA businesses, right? Yeah, that's that's uh, one of our core services. So a big kind of uh, part of our team does that. We do have a department also that does um, Amazon account management. So things like uh, monitoring your stranded inventory on a daily basis can be done, you know, by by our our team. A lot of the folks out there uh, that that work for us are actually former seller support guys. So like people who used to work directly for Amazon, and they do understand the kind of ins and outs of Seller Central really well to uh, you know to help the sellers out there. Awesome. So hope you sellers out there were nice to the seller support agents there because later you might be working <laughs> with them. So <laughs> there you go. be nice, be nice <laughs> to the seller support agents. But awesome, Ivan. We'll put the links to that in the show notes at kenjiry.com slash blog. And thank you so much for your time and everyone listening. Go out there, make some money and hope you have a good Q4 season. See you next time. For show notes and resources mentioned in this episode, visit KenjiROI.com.